Hello, welcome to the Classical Top 5. I'm Tommy Pearson and I'm with Richard Bratby and Charlotte Gardner, as always. Our subject this week is overtures, those works that set up either a bigger piece like an opera or a concert. There are a lot of them to choose from. So I've been quite strict with this one, only allowed pieces that are specifically called overtures by their composers. So no preludes, on tracks, main titles, that kind of thing. And thank you to all of you for your suggestions on Twitter. Wow, this one really caught on. And uh, we had hundreds of top fives from you. I'll try and get as many of them in as I can through the show. Um, our guest is a conductor who certainly led enough overtures to last a lifetime, I'm sure, particularly in his work in the Opera House as music director of Opera Factory in the 1980s, Opera North and English National Opera, of course, in the 90s and 2000s. He conducted many major premieres in his time at all of those. He was awarded the CBE in 2000 and conducted the last night of the proms in 2005. More recently, he's held principal positions in Australia, Spain and France and guests with orchestras around the world He's Paul Daniel. Paul, welcome to the Classical Top 5. Thanks so much for Thank doing this. Very nice to be here. It's a great privilege. Thank you very much. Now, what have you been Bye -bye. up to? What have you been up to? Because we very much know the situation here in the UK at the moment. You work with a lot of uh, European orchestras. Uh, uh, how has it been with you as far as work's concerned in the last year? Well, my principal work is actually with two orchestras now. Uh, when I'm, I, they're full-time jobs. One is with the National Orchestra in Bordeaux, which is one of the nas French national orchestras. And the other one is in uh, the top corner of Spain, in Galicia, uh, mm -hmm. the Real Philharmonia de, de Galicia. It's in Santiago de Compostela. Um, and by huge good luck or determination or, well, I don't know what it is really. I think, I think there's a lot, a lot of lobbying went on, but we were able to keep both of those orchestras playing pretty Amazing. well all the way through this time not for the first lockdown of course but you know once things started in in may i was off to france uh, and then i commuted back and forth and we managed to get a whole series of stuff going so i i'm of course extremely lucky and i know i mean the hardship and the impossible situation in this country is really difficult of course everywhere the same for the infection but there were some interesting things said you know in France, they did a kind of survey. They said, you know what? In all the orchestras that have performed, to which we've allowed audiences to come, there have been no cases of, of COVID infection during those uh, in, in those orchestras or, or audiences. Both of those orchestras have got to a point where they can't have audiences in the hall, especially in France, that continues. And now uh, we're just streaming, which is kind of soul destroying because the audience of course is the third part of the triangle you know composer performer and audience we need those people there we need their reactions we need their applause <laughs> we need their reactions but with empty halls it's tricky but in spain still 100 200 people in the hall allowed you know yeah amazing it, it occurred to me by the way looking uh, back on your biography that having spent so much time in the orchestral pit it can't be a coincidence that you've spent the more recent years uh, only conducting in place really lovely beautiful places because <laughs> um, so, so, you, you were, you know, there was there's the western australian orchestra of course in perth there's, there's bordeaux there's northern spain these were all yeah. very nice places to be well i did i did work out that of course they were by complete coincidence they were all well maybe i chose them in my sleep but they're mm. all on the west west coast of their country so the sunsets <laughs> are incredible they're all very close to the coast and they all have the most amazing wine just in the hinterland so i'm very well i'm very well spoiled to tell you <laughs> yes looking forward to your uh, announced position of uh, principal conductor of the cornish symphony orchestra oh very yeah sick. well that would be very nice <laughs> i'd love that <laughs> anyway now listen how did you get on with this the, the, I, we specialize in big subjects on this, uh, on this show <laughs> uh, but but actually by any stretch, uh, the overtures, there are a lot of overtures. And the last time I communicated with you, you just whittled it down to just under 500, I think you said. How, yeah. how have you got on? Well, I've failed. <laughs> so I think I'd better just sign out now. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you know, Toby, there are probably more overtures than anything else, aren't there? I don't know, maybe not. I think, I think might, you might be right. It, yeah. Certainly when you start to think of all the ones you love, they're certainly, you know, they just, the list is endless. And I looked on my shelves over here and I thought, what? 
I can't possibly choose. So I, I don't know. Do you, do you want me to start? <laughs> yes. I mean, you, you must choose. And of course, uh, as I say this often to our guests, though, you mustn't worry because almost as soon as we finish every podcast, we've all changed our minds and found another five. It's of course. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely yeah. fine to do that. So just <laughs> just dive in. Give us your first choice. Well, OK, I, I made a few criteria. I thought, now, how am I going to get this down at all? I thought, OK, they've got to have some personal meaning for me particularly you mentioned the fact I spent an awful lot of time in the pit but there are lots of other things that have meant a lot to me and I just I realized that actually the probably the very first overture I ever heard and was aware of listening to as a piece of orchestral music was actually in the cinema and it actually is an overture I mean most film music as you said earlier you know is sort of just main title music there but some composers and some some film composers actually named their opening music as overtures and um I, my parents, I think, took me to the cinema in Sutton Coldfield when I was probably five years old to watch. I didn't know I was going. I didn't know what it was. It was the biggest thrill of my life. And it was Mary Poppins, hmm. composed by the Herman Brothers. And it was the old days, you know, when you went into the cinema and there was a curtain and it stayed shut for the music. And yeah. it was uh, the thrill. I listen to that now and I think, I can remember that day, you know, it takes me straight there again. I think in a way that's what overtures should do. Shouldn't it? You know, they, they, they should kind of, they, they, they light this kind of fire inside you, you know, and the, the, the excitement of being in a place. And it, they're very much for me connected with the sense of where you heard them or where you played them, you know, and that yeah. sitting in that funny cinema in Sutton Coalfield. <laughs> And the orchestral playing, of course, is, you know, we've heard it many, many, many times since. And every time I hear it, you think, wow, what playing. Amazing. The Hollywood musicians, fantastic. Yeah. And it's a real overture. So that's yeah. that's a bit left field. I know I, you were expecting me to say Verdi, weren't you? Or well, no, or... no. And in fact, I, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I grappled with this uh, one, actually, because obviously bit, film music is very much my thing. I mean, there's a reason why it's called an overture. Uh, and that's precisely what it was. There are a big, many of these as you say, they were played uh, um, while the curtain was closed. Um, mm. And then <clears throat> once the once the film actually starts, the real, that's when the main title music comes in. So there is a difference between an overture and a main title in, in those big movies. I mean, I, yeah. I wrote down a few that are very particularly like that. So Lawrence of Arabia, for example, has an overture and then a main title music. So there you very, go. And, and, yeah. and it's very much that... Uh, shares that idea with the uh, musicals and opera, of course, where you get some of the big themes are in that overture. It's it's a, a little bit of a pricey of what's what's going to come. I, I um, must admit, the, the the very first piece I chose, actually, out, out, thinking in this kind of sphere, films and you know American music, was Corn Gold, the Seahawk, which I have adored. Every every opportunity I have to conduct it, I have a go. You know, I did it. I did it again in December. Yeah. Um, it's the most thrilling, exciting way to start a film. But <laughs> I looked at the information, and it is indeed a main title. I'm afraid it is a main title. Well, the other one, other, <laughs> other, other, other famous ones are Miklas Rocha's music for Ben Hur is an overture, um, uh, and the one I'm, I was, uh, there's another one I'm going to pick, but I'll, I'll come, I'll come to that uh, a little bit later, oh, which is one of the most famous. Oh. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pleased you, I'm pleased you started with the film, and as you say, I mean, it, so many people, their first experience of orchestral music is in the cinema so it's yeah it seems very appropriate yeah um well I, also just one thing to say is that the, the conductor of course i would think about this the, the conductor of that score uh and of many many other film scores was a guy mm. called erwin costal yeah or costal i'm not sure how he pronounced his name but you know he was a, a real he he decided not to go to university or college he decided to just become a music arranger and then look where he ended up you know he yeah. actually worked he actually orchestrated a lot of west side story as well he did yeah he did an yeah, incredible yeah. incredible musician you know somewhere down in the small print in most people's minds but he's yeah. an, he's a wonderful wonderful musician yeah well, it's a great choice. I mean, some great tunes, obviously, in Mary Poppins, beautifully orchestrated. And I agree uh, that I, I, we've done the overture to Mary Poppins in concert a few times. Um, always yeah. fun. And of course, everyone absolutely just as soon as those tunes come in, everybody smiles. What else would they would they do? Um, Charlotte, how did you get on with this? Because I there are I, I'm not going to pigeonhole you, but there are a lot of overtures, of course, in Baroque music. 
uh, aren't there? And I'm they assuming are. that one of them or two may seep <laughs> into your into your top five. How did you get on with this subject? Well, uh, it's I, I really enjoyed this one, and like Paul, actually, I decided that there had to be some personal residents coming in, and and yeah, that that's it. a lot of it goes well. No, about half of it goes right back to my beginning. So I thought I'd actually do what Paul has done and go right, right, right back to my music <laughs> with my first one. And it's Baroque. Uh, it is the overture to Handel's music for the Royal Fireworks. Now, um, I know I've talked about being a, starting on, as a violinist on, on this podcast, but my first instrument was actually a recorder. And I remember so clearly it was my seventh birthday. I got this very simple wooden recorder and my mum had made it out on its own little pouch out of um, Laura Ashley material, which was just the height of sophistication. It Very made classy. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, and I didn't start learning recorder through um, class group lessons. It was actually a very musical Swiss lady at my church. And I have this so clear memories. My first experience of playing music was going after school once a week to this Swiss lady's house. And so it's kind of classical music with this glorious little elderly Swiss clipped accent. And the first real music that I graduated off once I'd got through all the folk songs and the little um, the student ditties was Handel. Um, and there were, Walter Bergman did a wonderful couple of albums of recorder arrangements of Baroque, various things. He did a Bach album, but it was the Handel album I loved the most. It was um, trios for descant, treble and tenor. And it was a magical moment when I was playing this tune, these tunes. And of course, Handel was just, he was the king of overtures, the king of popular tunes. And so when I came to this, I thought, well, 42 operas alone. And he it was just, he lived and breathed theatre. He owned the stage. And what's more, he knew that he had to have his audience sitting up right from the beginning. And these theatres that he was in, this was before the days of dimmed lights. It would have mm -hmm. been a theatre where everybody could see everyone else. And a lot of the time they weren't coming for the music anyway. They were coming precisely to be seen and to see. And, and there would have been a lot of hubbub as well. So he knew that the first seconds of whatever he was putting on stage, they had to absolutely grab people. And um, the music for the Royal Fireworks, I mean, that overture, I mean, it's just it promises so much of what's to come. It sort of, it delivers while promising at the same time, the, the grandeur, the textural largesse, the, the brass-tastic music that has to carry outdoors and, and just hook people in even more so than in the, or in the opera pit, um, because you, he's also got the outdoors to contend with. Mm. So, so yeah, that was my first one. And I was thinking as I was preparing for this, I think Handel overtures should be heard in a concert hall a little mm. bit more. I mean, these days, symphony orchestras, Baroque period performance is so much more in their stylistic toolkit. Um, it would be a really interesting. I mean, if the Berlin Philharmonic can play Baroque, if they can play Handel under conductors such as Emmanuel Haim, then surely it's something that modern symphony orchestras should do, should do. And I think to start, you know, a symphony concert with a whole load of romantic um, contemporary repertoire with a stonking Handel overture would be a very fine way to go. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's an interesting um, thought, though, about overtures it, it, that occurred to us all, I think, perhaps, and I know that Richard had something to say on this, is that a lot of orchestras, I think, now are not programming overtures because it seems a bit of a cliche, doesn't it? The whole mm -hmm. overture concerto symphony model seems very, very kind of ordinary, even though it's perfectly reasonable and fine. But I think some orchestras are, are almost afraid to program an overture because it seems a bit cheap, a little bit, bit, a bit popular. Richard? Uh, there's two two things at work there. I say, firstly, I think what you say, they, they think it's it's too obvious, too cliche. They've been told that the three part concert structure is is boring and stale, despite all the evidence that audiences absolutely still love it. Want it, yes. respond to it. <laughs> um, who cares about the audience? Though? I mean, it's not about them, is it? Um, and also, secondly, um, this is a problem I've talked about before on these podcasts that um, we don't take um, less heavy music seriously. Everything has to be profound, weighty, massive, life changing experience. Experience. and overtures by their nature have to leave you wanting more um they don't give you the whole story they're there to grab to entertain to create a mood all those things are very rarely there to sort of give you the whole epic life-changing journey of a Mahler symphony and, and i think it's a feeling it's a bit beneath us now as classical musicians to get involved in anything less than you know a shostakovich 8 experience or a Mahler 9 experience mm -hmm. and overtures require lightness swiftness delicacy wit playfulness all these very unfashionable qualities and of course melody which you know deeply uncool 
Um, <laughs> so um, anyway, my, my choice, I, again, I, I, I um, sort of began by just going in with a personal angle to two overtures, which sort of um, kick-started my, my own sort of musical life moments. These are incredible. These are moments I can actually remember in my life when suddenly I was grabbed, I was hooked. Um, this is when I was quite young. I suddenly realised the power of the live art form. The first opera, the first non Gilton Sullivan opera I ever saw live um, um, was The Bartered Bride by Smetana, hmm. um, at Liverpool Empire, with Charles McCarris conducting. I didn't know that at the time. I didn't really know who he was or, or care at the age of 11. But suddenly the lights in the theatre went down and Smetana throws up this great flourish of sound, like he's revving the engine of the orchestra. He just throws out this great swaggering flourish of orchestral sound at the beginning of this overture. Then he just drops down to absolute silence and begins this brilliant, bustling, fugal sort of build-up. So instantly you're, you're in the mood. You, 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 you've been grabbed, you've been thrilled, then suddenly you're pulled in. Something's going to happen here. Something exciting is occurring. You, you, you listen intently. You know, something is building. Um, it's a delightful overture. Um, I mean, it's a sort of Czech marriage of Figaro. Um, mm-hmm. it, it has um, along its course. I mean, it has, it has the folk dances. It has the, the verve. It has the wit. It has the romance. It's all there. That it does that thing of sort of summing up everything you're going to experience in the next three hours of opera, um, without kind of spoiling it or giving any of it away. And in its own self-contained, brilliant little package. And by the time that ends, and I mean the most thrilling moment I, I say in, in in artistic or musical life for me is always that moment when when suddenly the chord shifts or or the silence falls and the curtain goes up um, and it prepares a moment for that per- perfectly. Um, the, the other piece that had a similar effect on me um, is Blinkers Over Chores of Rustam and Lud Miller. It's another one that zips off the starting block straight away. I remember, I think it's the first time I'd ever heard a live symphony orchestra. It was a Liverpool Phil. And they came came on stage and went straight into the opening of Rustam and Lud Miller. The richness of that sound, the, the energy and verve of that sound, I mean, that grabs you, doesn't it? It's, it's just a cracking little piece. Later on, as a cellist, I love playing that second subject. Uh, Richard, you, you certainly choose the pieces that orchestras have to warm up for, don't you? <laughs> you, can't go, you can't go on stage un, unwarmed up for those two, can you? <laughs> you really... No, but you, you bring something interesting up there, Paul, I was going to ask you. I've, I've lost count the number of times I've played in amateur or semi-pro orchestras where the vast majority of the rehearsal has always been on the big work in the program. It might be the concerto, it might be symphony. And mm-hmm. then the last 10 minutes we spend on the overture, whatever it might be. As, and sometimes, frankly, it's the hardest piece in the program. But because it's, it feels like it's throwaway, because it's just a little lollipop at the beginning, somehow yeah. it doesn't deserve as much rehearsal. That, that must be a danger for a conductor huge danger you're absolutely right and you uh, I've learned my lesson many times in my career I tell you <laughs> I think I'm, my favorite probably my favorite overture for a quick rehearsal is probably the overture to the Grand Macabre of uh, Ligeti wow which is about a minute long mm. and it's just the percussion section playing eight or ten car horns do you know that piece no. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the most wonderful, wonderful send up of the idea of, <laughs> of difficult overtures or things. And my goodness, you listen to it. <laughs> yeah. But no, you're absolutely right. You're, you're right. They, they, some of these pieces are really demanding. Yeah. And I, I often think when I'm in the opera house, you know, think so many of the, the great opera overtures, are probably, you know, were not, especially before Verdi, probably more, more like, you know, in the time of Rossini, they didn't expect people to listen to them much you know because everyone was just talking dining you know making love whatever they were doing you know gambling in the in, the, in their boxes <laughs> nobody was interested until you got a great big drum roll for the beginning of the first act yeah fascinating one, <laughs> one by the way one of the pleasures are on twitter with all of the uh, so many people we've got um uh, giving us out their top fives was was watching richard um point out to people that quite often the wagner that they really like is in fact a prelude not an yeah. overture and there's all that, there's spiel, all that yeah. discussion uh, there was somebody <laughs> um somebody uh, stephen harrison uh, chose as his top five tannhäuser um flying dutchman tristan and Isolde, parsifal and de meister singer i think mm-hmm. it's de meister singer is a prelude isn't it um but uh, there's all that um and so some of those were were disqualified. Um, and actually, I was going to also mention, um, Charlotte, I, I would be, I think it'd be fair to say that very few people chose Baroque um, 
overtures, interestingly. I mm. mean, you, there's all the ones, uh, many people mentioned the two that, that Richard have mentioned already uh, and so on, but actually the Glasgow University Opera Society, um, their, their five were Dido Aeneas, for example, Purcell, um, Zais, um, Ramo, and uh, various others. So they, they, are, they are in there. Thank yeah, you. they are in there, but, it's, it, but there are quite a lot of big, very famous overtures in, in everyone's list. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll come to them. Um, I think before we come back to you, Paul, I think I might as well throw in my film music one too then, because I agree with you that, um, you know, it, it, it certainly is allowed because they're called overtures. And as I, as I said, they were very much overtures because it was seen, I mean, we're also talking about many films that had intervals as well, intermissions, of course. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, in, in the work that I've, been, uh, that I've been doing in the last few years where we've been doing full movies with live orchestra playing the soundtrack, even if the film didn't originally have an intermission, we put one in. And it's rather lovely because it is a very old fashioned way of, of presenting movies that they had an overture, then they had the main title and then halfway through they had an intermission. It seems almost extraordinary. And these often, by the way, in films that are shorter than a lot of modern movies that don't have any intermission, of course. Um, but anyway, the one, the one I was gonna, was gonna pick is uh, Gone With The Wind, Max Steiner, uh. because because I think you, you truly can say that they don't write them like that anymore. I mean, there's, there's of course a reason why they don't write them like that anymore. They don't really make films like that anymore. <clears throat> but that is a tune, that is a great, a theme, uh, Tara's theme, that you, it's just totally unforgettable. As soon as you hear it, it's, it's a classic. I'm, I'm, you know, obviously I wasn't there in 1939 when the film was released, but I would imagine the audience felt that too, this familiarity with that sort of sweep and grandeur. And of course, it does what any great overture does. It throws you into the world of the thing that you're about to experience. And in this case, obviously, the biggest movie really of all time with Gone wow. with the Wind. Yeah. Um, and it is just the most fabulous, big, romantic, wonderful theme. It's an, it's an interesting score in a way. It has a few issues attached to it through the film itself. And in fact, what, there's a book called Hollywood Rhapsody that argues that some of the some of the music choices are actually rampantly racist in, in the way they are used to depict certain characters within the within yeah. the movie. And of course, the movie itself does have various issues in that regard, too. But, but it was Max Steiner, is it the yeah. composer? Yeah, yeah. he was probably the most important composer in the history of film music. I mean, he was the one that really established. He wrote um, the first through score un, with underscore music, um, which was for King Kong. Um, and uh, whilst you know the, the classical music establishment, if one's going to call it that, will always point to Korngold as the great innovator, but mm. he he was really in the wake of Steiner. He was Steiner was the one that really um, Steiner, yeah. put down the mark and said, "This is what I think." You know, taking uh, the tradition from the great romantics, of course, and Strauss and others uh, 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 as well, giving a film a familiar feel. But uh, yeah, Gone with the Wind overture is just the most wonderful ridiculously sentimental well it sort of feels sentimental luscious bit of music um and one of the all-time great film themes so um anyway let's go to your second one paul well i suppose i must go into the pit <laughs> into the orchestra pit and um okay another very personal and very early memory uh it was probably the first time i was i went to the opera i think and I, here we are <laughs> i'm a schoolboy and I'm in Coventry in the West Midlands and I, I love my music. I'm a chorister in the cathedral uh, and I go to the, what was it called? The Coventry Hippodrome where English National Opera or Sadler's Wells it was in those days on tour and it's Magic Flute. And it was another of those experiences. I didn't really know what it was all about. I knew, didn't know what it was about at all and I didn't ex know what to expect. And there I was sitting with this curtain huge curtain closed in front of me and a whole orchestra there uh and so this music starts and of course it's captured me ever since and it's gone all this in my career and you know i've been very lucky to get that into a few places <laughs> but what an amazing piece of of again of music that lights all the fires and, and has them burning just at the right temperature so when the when the pieces when the overture's finished you're ready for the for, for the for the for the drama to start and of course, for me, overtures like that can only belong as part of the opera. You know, it's very difficult for me to 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 play them in in concert without feeling, oh, 
yeah, that's great. But now what comes next? You know, I, yeah. it's the what comes next, which is which is built into the way I want to conduct this, the, these pieces, you know. Yes. But of course, we all know the piece so well. I just I, I, I just wonder what it must have been like when when they've played it the first time, you know, this funny little theatre outside the city walls in Vienna, you know, with the Chicaneda's weird theatre group. He was, I was reading a little bit, I've forgotten about this actually, but, you know, the idea that this was, this theatre that Chicaneda had in just outside Vienna, uh, they were, they were putting on premieres like every month. They did an enormous number of performances of completely new pieces in the, whatever it was, 10 years he was in charge, you know, and this was just another of them. But <laughs> he struck gold with Zabba Flirter with Magic Flute. <laughs> <laughs> he certainly did, yeah. I, I mean, I was assuming that Mozart was going to appear at some point in this uh, programme. And of course, he, he features a lot in the uh, tweets that we, we had. Magic Flute, yeah. Don, Gi Don Giovanni, um, uh, yeah, Marriage of, Marriage of Figaro. They're, they're all in there somewhere. In fact, I think... I'm right in saying that pretty much all of Verdi and all of Mozart and all of Rossini has appeared somewhere in, mm -hmm. in people's people's tweets at some point. Uh, fantastic. Um, Charlotte, a second one from you. OK, um, I'm going to take us to a concert overture um, and to Portsmouth Point ah. by Bolton. Ooh, 1925 both th this is just an absolutely fabulous piece this was um he composed it in his early 20s he was living in london with the sitwells which were the sort of the rival eccentrics to the bloomsbury set and they had this thomas rowlandson <coughs> print in there hanging up in their house thomas rowlandson was um Georgian era cartoonist satirist along the lines of hogarth and although some of his uh, a lot of his caricatures of you know Bordy, and there is a dark edge, like with Hogarth, this particular print of his of um, Portsmouth Pier, Portsmouth Docks. It's it's not like that. It's kind of it's a joyous dockside life. It feels more raucously, raucously naughty than dangerously debauched and dark. Mm -hmm. And and the music that Walton was inspired to write for it is kind of what happens if an English sea shanty collides with Stravinsky for a walk through a Hogarthian street scene with shades of Muppet Christmas Carol in it? It's, <laughs> it's, it's crazy, bonkers, joyous stuff. And uh, apparently his theme came to him as well as he was riding along the number 22 bus in London. And, and you hear the, the sort of the early, this early 20 something living it up in London, the roaring 20s whilst composing foxtrots for the Savoy Orchestra. And um, it's an orchestral showpiece as well. I mean, talking about warming up at the beginning and needing to be really warmed up. I mean, this one, constant changes of meter. It kind of gives Debussy's show uh, a run for its money. Um, asymmetric melodies, syncopations. Um, it's fun. It's really, really fun. Mm. Um, so so I, I think it's one that we should hear more. I and mean, I actually discovered it when I was researching this. So it's not a new piece for me mm. by any sh shades. And it is one of my classical top five discoveries. Uh, and the other thing that I like about it is that, you know, finding this theme from the top of the number 22 bus, it's, it's shades of Stravinsky's um, C major symphony where he finds a theme through um, this automobile ride along the Hollywood Boulevard or Rhapsody in Blue when Gershwin finds his theme on the train. So there's something about being mm. on a moving noisy object that appears to <laughs> buy some really fantastic <laughs> music. Yes, then it was suggested by a couple of people actually on, on Twitter, but also uh, David Benedict, the uh, the writer and uh, critic also suggested uh, Scapino or Scapino, mm. uh, I mean, so it's another Walton one. Um, he also uh, suggested, by the way, Gypsy, the overture to Gypsy by Jul Jul St Julie Stein. Um, but because uh, actually that is one of the great musicals uh, overtures mm. uh, as well, particularly in the movie, I think when it's uh, expanded orchestration. But uh, that, that was an interesting, an interesting one. Uh, Richard, how about you? I mean, please tell me you've got a Wagner in there because... <laughs> You know, he wrote some great overtures. Um, well, this was, was three, aren't there? There was Tannhäuser, Rienzi, and the Flying Dutchman. The rest are all really preludes that yeah. don't, I think, really work away from the opera. Now, including the Master Singer, which I don't think works away from the opera oh, either. I think that sort of it's a sort of stuck-on C major ending at the end of the Master Singer prelude, that sort of balances the whole piece, and it sort of absolutely reinforces the sort of stereotype of Wagner that's held by people who have 
only played in orchestral concerts and don't know much of Wagner. Um, you know, they, they, they think he's loud, they think he's brash, they think he's assertive. That's what they get to hear in the one piece of Wagner they play regularly. And, and so so the cycle continues. You know, it's, it, it only really works when you've got the whole of Act 1 of the, bass, the Master Singer hanging off the end of it. That's that's what it's meant to balance, uh, yeah. not the rest of the concert. Too powerful. Um, I agree. Yeah, Tristan and, um, yeah, Lowe and Grin, um, both clearly preludes, Parsifal likewise, you know, great set, setting mood. The, the one I would choose, if I was going to choose a Wagner, um, I, I, I go early, um, back, back to the world of grand opera, you know, the, the young composer trying to make his name in Rienzi. Yeah. Um, the one which gets played more than any of the opera, you know, more, more than its opera ever does. You know, it's, you go through an entire <laughs> opera going live without seeing a production of Rienzi. Um, some might say that's a good thing. Um, but it's Wagner trying to do the Meyerbeer thing, the, the grand Rossini thing, um, the early Verzi thing in a way. He's sort of com- creating this sort of um, piece out of themes from the opera on the grandest scale. But somehow, um, you know, the opera itself is a great stonking piece of bombast, you know, grand opera, um, scenic opera, the kind of thing that Wagner later reacted against in a big way. Um, but it's a stonker of a piece, and it, it does work really well in concert. Um, it is clearly conceived as an independent piece in the old school Italian, it's opera, op, French opera tradition, um, and it really, really works. And it doesn't get played that much anymore. And um, I, I'll always I'll always sort of carry a flag for the overture, at, re- at least, if not the rest of the opera. Um. I'm so pleased you, you, you've, you've done a Wagner though. I was absolutely, <laughs> totally relying on you doing so. It's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, I, I wrote down a, a few that I, I entirely associate with youth orchestras that, that actually I, I very rarely hear anybody else play ever. Um, like uh, Zampa. Yay. I mean, who plays that now? I mean, I, I, <laughs> everyone was playing it when I was a kid in every youth orchestra. You'd look at the stand, there'd be Zampa. Ba, 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 ba. Off we go. Um, that was always uh, a great fun. Um, Finlandia isn't called an overture, but, uh, you know, effectively is one. And that was another one that's, uh, I, I guess, is still played quite a lot. Egmont. Egmont is one that we're uh, f- for forever playing Egmont. Um, and Brahms Academic Overture. I don't know whether that's one that will be be chosen, but um, that that's another one that I really totally associate with youth orchestras. We were, seem to be playing them all the time um but the one i the one i have chosen i also very much associate with our youth orchestra in kent kent youth orchestra because i really hated it when we did it uh, i was a teenager then and i really didn't get elgar i did not um connect with his music at all and in fact quite objected to the to the piece we did and the piece that i've now chosen is in one of my top five which is in the south um mm-hmm. One of the reasons, one of the reasons, apart, quite apart from just not really connecting with Elgar's music, not being able to find a way through, was the fact that this is a twenty-minute overture. I thought, if you know, if the overture is twenty minutes, what's next? Um, I, it felt didn't feel like an overture. It feels much more like a tone poem, really, which is, of course, partly what what it is. Um, but as I got older, and really started to listen to Elgar's music more, and for whatever reason, whether it's age and experience or what. I started to absolutely love Elgar's music. In the South, I think, apart from the Second Symphony, is probably my fa- favorite of his works. It's got one of the one of those great um, themes that Elgar brings in very uh, very early on. Um, it's got that amazing orchestration that Elgar does, where it feels like the whole orchestra is playing, but you, but everything has such clarity about it. Mm-hmm. Um, it but not in a, not in a, in a way that like Mahler does, which is very similar where he's, everybody's playing, but you have to really center in on what, what's actually there to hear uh, prominently. There's something about the way everything kind of moves in and out of each other in Elgar's scores, which I, I really, really love. That happens in In the South. Um, and then there's this extraordinary plaintive melody that the viola plays in the middle of In the South, which, I remember as a teenager just being bored by, but now I find extremely moving. This um, Mark Elder um, of this parish, he uh, did a wonderful discovering music of Radio Three on, on in the south, and he because Elgar used that theme as a song as well later on. He used that song version um, to kind of illustrate um, the melody and, and how it was used then uh, I was used in, in the South. It's a beautiful way of doing it. It really opened up that piece to me as well. And I think he, by the way, I think he performs it brilliantly with the Halle on his recording. Um, but uh, yeah, that I think in the South really speaks to me now. It's an overture in name, but it, I think it's one of those ones, instead of being a piece that 
isn't called an overture but it is I, it feels to me that it is called an overture but it isn't really <laughs> but mm. it's much more i mean because obviously it's it's subtitled alasio so uh after the place that he visited on holiday with his family wasn't it in the early 1900s and and i think it came to him very very quickly it was another one of those examples of a like charlotte was saying it's one where you just something happens to you and you suddenly just get it you get the ideas and you've practically i think he actually said to me that it, it basically wrote itself after that. Once he got it in his head, it was just a case of writing it down. Gosh, if only we could all be like that. Um, <laughs> but I think I think in the South is is an extraordinary piece. I mean, I, you know, Cocaine is more of a throwaway. I think it's a wonderful piece, but it's a bit more of a of a throwaway, not throwaway piece. But you know what I mean. It's a bit more of an occasional work. In the South is just much more substantial. I think. Uh, I don't know, Paul. You got thoughts on on Elgar? Oh, so many. And rather like you, I think quite a, a lot of the, that life experience, uh, one's own personal life experience weighs in on, on how one feel, how, how you feel about Elgar, I think. You know, I mean, I, I remember being thrilled by the Indian variations when I first heard it when I was very young. And uh, like many of us, you know, you, gra you gradually not learn more about him that's important but feel more yeah. of what he's what he's communicating what he's giving us yeah. i think it's a bit like dvorak for me not that not to compare composer with composer but that that this sense of someone writing completely honestly from the heart and such an amazing heart and such an amazing de deep personality that he, he he has to that he wants to express and it's it's not kind of secret and it's not a code but gradually you just understand more of it i it's my experience you know it's it, it's it, 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 it's the it's it's like they're like confessions of a very honest man and even when cocaine you know he's having fun still even with music like that for me you know when you perform it more and you look at it again and think again about it you you you, you feel like you feel you're getting closer to his heart. Yeah. Very troubled and very strange and d disturbed life he led. Huge success and huge anxiety, all mixed together. Even in these overtures, you 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 can you can get cl close to that. I I, I adore the Elgar. You can imagine. It, so what about, what about what about another minutes choice? Well asking, yeah. oh. what a, okay. What about another choice, then, Paul? Uh, well, okay. We've. Uh, where do I go? I've got. I've still got twenty-five. <laughs> okay. No, I'm going to go into the pit. I'm going to go Italian. I'm going to go with Verdi. Um, I'm going to. Well, you know, I've had a very lucky life so far, conducting quite a lot of Verdi in quite a lot of places. And tell you what, of course, the music's great. It's so well known. Some of the pieces not well known enough, actually. I think that some of the extraordinary overtures, like the short one for Enani, for example, or even shorter for Due Foscari, you know, they're amazing pieces. Mm. But with all of these pieces, you sense that this is a man who was composing and he knew exactly his audience, his theatre. OK, this is going to be a noisy place. I'm going to have to start with a big, loud chord. This place, I feel more in control. I'm better known. I can, I can play with my, the imagination. I can set a scene which is much quieter. I think, for example, the the overture of Bocca Negra, Simone Bocca Negra, for me is one of the most extraordinary. It's it's probably one of the simplest ideas. It's just a series of strophes, a series of phrases, played mostly by the strings. But the scene he sets. You know that you're. It's night. You know it's night time. The curtain hasn't gone up, but you know from the, the the way the music is ebbing and flowing, you sense that you're in the port. You're by the sea. You're near. You know you're watching this very slow swell of the sea under the moonlight, and you know that this is going to be a very dark and and serious story from just from the way he writes. He's just four bar phrase, another four bar phrase. I remember hearing it for the first time. Abado conducted it uh, in that famous production. Who was it by? It was done at Covent Garden, but I uh, I heard a radio broadcast, I think, from La Scala, again, when I was very young. And I thought, I want to be a conductor. That was one of the first times I thought, ooh, if I could stand somewhere and be able to conduct that music, 
I, that would make me ha happier than anything. And of course, <laughs> occasionally you get the chance. But that's one of my great, great Verdi overtures. There are many, many more, of course. You know, yes. I don't know. I could list them all, couldn't I? <laughs> well, many, many, that, many that's of them very mentioned. special for me. Many of them mentioned by by our contributors on, on Twitter. I just want to I want to go through some people's top five lists and and see if uh, any of them are shared by any of us here. Mm. Um, so Matt Shipton, uh, Tannhauser, uh, Brahms Academic, Mozart Figaro, w William Tell, uh, Rossini, and Mendelssohn Hebrides. Uh, we've got uh, Winston Mize, is Beethoven, Coriolan, Schumann, Manfred, Tchaikovsky, Romeo and Juliet, um, Wagner, Tannhauser. Matthew Rose, Ruslan and Ludmilla, uh, Glinka, um, Bernstein Candide, um, Figaro, Parsifal, oh dear, no, that's a prelude, says, um, and uh, uh, where, who else? Tim Ashley, uh, the writer of Critic, uh, Mozart, Don Giovanni, uh, Beethoven, Coriolan, um, Wagner, Tannhauser, La Force of De The Force of Destiny, uh, uh, Verdi, of course, and Stephen Groves, Egmont, Festive Overture, Shostakovich, In the South, Elgar, Cocaine, Elgar, and Tchaikovsky, Romeo and Juliet. Right, any of those um, uh, tally with any of you? Uh, you've both been putting your hands up. Charlotte? Brahms, Academic Overture. Um, this one goes back to my musical beginnings as well. Um, when, in the sixth form, when one of my friends were bopping around to Oasis and Blur and Pulp, I had just <laughs> discovered Brahms Symphony Number no. 4. It was the set work for A-Level. And I can remember just mooning over this picture of the young Brahms with his floppy blonde hair and thinking that he was just so much better than all the pop stars. Um, so that, that was my first thing with Brahms. And, and what it was about Brahms, it was just, I recognized in his music, Paul, you were talking about Elgar and his, his big heart and how he wanted to express that in his music. And that was Brahms as well, just the most enormous heart, but, a fragile and tender heart that also got very bruised. And then you have this academic overture. Um, 1879, he was in his mid forties and it was a thank you to the University of Breslau for bestowing an honorary degree on him. And they described, as the, they described him as the leader in Germany of music of the most severe order. So what's he going to do? He goes and composes this sort of operetta style medley of university <laughs> drinking songs. But he does it so absolutely brilliantly. He just pulls out all the stops, one of his biggest orchestras, this grand noble introduction, and you don't know what's coming. And then I can just imagine them all sitting in the hall. And then after the timpani roll and the brass present this majestic theme, and they must have all been sitting there going, oh, wait, oh, I know this one. Oh, what is it? What is it? And then the penny drops. <laughs> They're going what? And uh, I love that. Uh, he must have been absolutely chuckling into his manuscript as he penned it. And uh, sym symphonic as well, just uh, it's a four sectional thing, um, this brilliant skirt. So, um, and I think why I love it so much, why it's so important to me is that I just, Brahms is a person that I connect to and I feel sorry for him. Um, in so much of his music, there is this vulnerability, this, you know, his free but joyful motto that every now and then gets darkened and for example in the third symphony you know that he's wondering is he really very joyful with his freedom he's in love with Clara Schumann um, and the same thing that I was writing about the first violin sonata yesterday and again you've got this Reagan lead he's he's free but he's not entirely sure he's joyful and for me, the academic overture is a taster of what everybody, you know, what the woman who he never met missed, what this life he could have had, had he not met the Schumanns who sort of made him um, professionally, but broke him personally. Um, it's a taste of, you know, the, the fun, joyful Brahms and, and this big heart, um, but with a sense of humour. And he, I don't think he had quite enough of that in his life. I, uh, I, was, I was put off the academic overture a long time about 35 years ago because we did a charity day with the all the youth orchestras in Kent and um, one of the things you could do is you could bid to conduct the Kent Youth Orchestra and there was a little handful of pieces that you could choose from to conduct everybody chose the Brahms Academic we did it about six times and after the end of that day I was, it was a bit like a, it's like a brass band competition where everybody plays the same piece over and over again and uh, by the end I was thinking do you know what I've had enough of this piece. That was 35 <laughs> years ago, and I'm still holding 
Because <laughs> it's, I mean, oh, it, it's, so it's, sad. Because it's not like doing a quick, you know, little Rossini, is it? I mean, it, it is. Yeah. It's quite. It's a substantial piece. And, yeah, it's uh, a good ten so, minutes or so. Yeah, and 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 kind of heavy feeling. And so, uh, yeah, to do it six times in a row is, is uh, but it's it's a shame. It skewered my my opinion of it. Anyway, Richard, another one from you. Well, you were talking earlier about um, Zampa, um, and yeah. you know, there is some genre of composers who perhaps wrote only known, um, really, in the concert hall for an overture, a well-known overture that once upon a time was a popular classic, perhaps mm. less so now, as Zampa is one of them. I was thinking of um, pieces like um, Donna Diana Overture by Reznicek, which is a real fizzy little Viennese concert firecracker or concert opener. Um, things like the overture Rain... Um, Raymond by Ambrose Thomas, which was a favourite of one of my youth orchestras. Um, just fantastically balletic little French piece with a physically fizzing, rollicking gallop of an ending. Um, the opera I've never seen, don't suppose I ever will see it. I'd love to. Um, but there we are. Um, the one, um, um, uh, The Land of the Mountain and the Flood by Hamish McCunn, the oh, only yes. piece anyone knows by Hamish McCunn, the only <laughs> melody anyone knows. What a melody. What a melody. What an atmosphere. <laughs> How perfectly he does it. Um, that sort of sense of, of, of the Victorian Highlands. It's like a landseer painting and music. Lovely dusky colours. Um, no, the, the another one youth orchestra piece, that, by the way. Another... God knows why. The thing's in B major, which is, you know, that's his <laughs> murder for strings. Um, you know, I, I ends in B major anyway. Um, the one I was going to land on um, is, is the Merry Wives of Windsor Overture by Otto Nicolai, which I think is still kind of clinging on just about in the concert halls. It's an opera overture. Opera that is absolutely delightful, as I'd love to see, and I don't think has been done professionally in the UK in my lifetime. Certainly not my opera going lifetime. Um, and it's it's all those things that you get from Weber, from Mendelssohn, the, the magic, the fairy music, the wit, the lightness, also that sort of sense of Viennese comedy. He, he works in Vienna. There's, there's that sort of <clears> opera-like <throat> sense of, of lilting Johann Strauss-like melody. It has all these things, this rapturous opening, which is, again, he's just adapting music from the opera, but he's reusing it so very, very skillfully. The, the opening, just, you know, high violin note, like the beginning of Mahler 1. Mon must have known this piece, no question. He will have conducted it. Um, it's high violin notes. It's a moonlit night where sort of the moon rises and there's some low melody rising up from the cellos. This lovely, flowing, serene melody, giving away to mischief to sort of the oboes and woodwinds larking around. And then this most delicate, uh, what Mendelssohn used to call fairy music, as the allegro launches and you know rustling violins, beautifully scored, absolutely delicately, fizzes away, and then it swings into this absolutely glorious second subject. I I I, I always believe a great overture has to have one absolute lollipop of a tune, and the Merry Wives of Windsor definitely has that. <clears throat> your head you it lilts it's you know it's the epitome of lilt you know it, it, it sticks in your head and it goes round and round and round and then the whole thing whirls to a finish with like trombone sort of striding down through the texture cymbals crashing everything you want and then this delightful opera which we never ever see begins but we do at least have the overture of the concert hall and i think it was the first overture since we're talking about youth orchestras and early experiences it was the first overture i played in the Wirral youth orchestra and i i just remember as we began it and the violins hit the high notes just held it and was still and we and the cellos began to play our melody. I just remember the tingles going up my spine, just the excitement of discovering this piece, making it, making those sounds come to life. And yeah. again, he's clearly school of Mendelssohn, school of Schubert, school of Rossini, certainly. There's that sort of Italian willingness to use the bass drum and cymbals and get a bit of a mood going. Um, and school of Mendelssohn, the fairy music, it's a <coughs> sense of magic. He's, he's it's the only, it's, it's up there, I think, with Mendelssohn's Midsummer Night's Dream over to capturing that Shakespearean combination of low comedy and absolute enchantment. Right, I'm going to throw in um, one which, uh, out of all of the overtures, is probably the most performed piece, one of the most performed pieces in the world. Uh, I mean, obviously not in the last year, but certainly uh, generally speaking, and that's uh, Candide Overture by Leonard Bernstein. Um, yeah. You know, because uh, it is almost the perfect overture. Um, it's, it's such a great way to, I mean, it's the, it's the ultimate overture and it's a great way to start a concert. I loved watching him. I can't even remember the orchestra now that he was conducting, but he sort of stops conducting uh, and just does it with his shoulders a bit and a few eyebrow movements. And that, that's one, because it is one of those pieces that sort of drives itself almost. Uh, and you can have fun with. Of course, it has some of the great melodies that, that, that come up in, in Candide, um, but it's just such a brilliantly constructed little piece um, and puts a smile on, on everybody's face. And it's not that difficult to really 
see why it's so popular in the concert hall i mean obviously the the piece itself is 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 you know as as a as a operetta is done in the opera house probably not as as much as as many of his other works but uh, and it does have its issues um but certainly the 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 overture is is easily its best known uh, part um yeah i love it and in fact I, when bernstein died the new york phil did uh, a performance they opened their um, concert that they dedicated to him with the Candid Overture without a conductor and uh, I th th it was extremely moving you know mm. just it, the, the gap the space that Bernstein would have filled and uh, it was just a gap and they played that piece wonderfully warm-hearted lovely piece um, so uh, I think that's got to be in there uh, as I say for, for sheer popularity but also it's just so brilliant so brilliantly done and in that way that Bernstein could with theatre music. He just knew which buttons to press and exactly how to press them, uh, which is why his theatre music is so popular. Paul, you must have done Candy loads, have you? Uh, not the whole piece. The overture, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Funnily enough, I was thinking about Bernstein a lot because when, while you were talking, because uh, I, I, one piece which I have conducted, which I adored, is On the Town, the musical. You know, we did a... We were, we were desperately trying to convince the Bernsteins to allow us, the, the estate to allow us to do a staged pr pr production at English National Opera. Uh, and, okay, the story's going backwards now because, of course, we did achieve that in the end. But we, yeah. um, I, I, did, I conducted a concert, per, well, a staged concert performance at the Festival Hall, a one-off, really, about a few years before. Uh, and and that kind of helped us along the way because they then thought, OK, yeah, maybe we'll give them the permission. But there is an overture in On the Town. It's it sometimes played at the beginning, depending on when Bernstein did it. And it sometimes played actually as, as, as an on track, but it was still called an overture. So I'm going to hang on to it. <laughs> and it's, it's another it's a wonderful knees up and beautifully when he conducted it. You can hear it on his cast album brilliantly played you know the, the playing you know the playing has got to be as good as that to, to really to sell the piece but it's it's all these little little medley of all the all the great songs from on the town i love that music mm -hmm. i love i love being in a broadway theater when the when when you when you're waiting for a musical to start the oh yeah amazing feeling only in only on broadway not even in you know in the west end can you get oh. that same feeling <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to go to your fourth, your fourth choice now, Paul. Oh gosh, where can I go? Well, actually, I hadn't. While I've been while we've been talking, I've I've suddenly decided I'm going to talk about French overtures <laughs> because, of course, okay. the word wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the French. You know, it's <laughs> it's actually it's a French word, ouverture. <laughs> and I thought, poor old Berlioz, we haven't mentioned him once. You know, there are there are <laughs> something like ten or twelve overtures, and I bet. He doesn't come on everybody's list all the time because they're quite eccentric and they're they're not played enough. You know, we how often we hear the Roman Carnival, I suppose, quite a lot, don't we? That's that's probably the most popular all, all of them. But uh, Cellini, Benvenuto Cellini, wow. <laughs> but what's Berlioz doing? You know, I th I always feel with Berlioz that he's he's kind of gets hold of an idea, whether it's a purely symphonic piece like the Fantastique or um, a, a dramatic piece like these overtures and thinks, yeah, that's me. Yeah, yeah, that's me. I'm as as big and as strong as and important as brave and whatever, you know, as that. He, he, he kind of writes himself into the... It's very autobiographical, I think. Every note of, of Berlioz is like that. Yes. Le Corsair. I, d I, I had a chance to do that a couple of years ago. So it's a fiendishly difficult piece. Uh, but... but well, if, when 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 the orchestra can play it, wow! It's they're, they're wonderful pieces. Well, Beatrice I should, and Benedict, another one. Well, I but, I should I should I think this is the right moment to mention Michael Seal, uh, your colleague conducting colleague, yeah. and his top five on Twitter are in no particular order: Berlioz, Roman Carnival, Berlioz, well, La Corsaire, Le Corsaire, sorry, uh, Berlioz, Les, 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 Les Francs Jus, uh, Berli, Berlioz, King Lear. And Berlioz, Beatrice, Beatrice, and Benedict. So there you are. <laughs> there you <go. laughs> he doesn't fun. like he doesn't like Berlioz much, does he? Mike? He hates Berlioz. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, how wonderful. Um, and uh, in fact, he chose a runner-up, especially for me, because I think he knew perfectly well 
I would pick Rob Roy. Uh, and it's not, and it's not Berlioz. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but we'll, we'll come to that now. Listen, we're, we're, we're getting towards the end. Before we hear Paul's last one, we should do a quick roundup as well of ones we've missed out so far. Um, Charlotte, ones that need, that you think need to be mentioned. Yeah, two that I think absolutely need to be mentioned. The first is, um, it was notable for its absence on social media yesterday, Tchaikovsky's Overture Solennelle, the 1812. Now, to me, this has suffered a similar fate to the William Tell Overture. It's Everyone thinks it's just far too plebeian to even look at. We're not allowed to admit that we like it. But like the William Tell, it has this absolutely wonderful opening, this, this Russian chorale, muted strings. And then he takes you on a 15, almost 15 minute journey. And, and it's incredibly cleverly done. It kind of builds in force and intensity until right at the end, you've got this fresh nancho, the, the Marseillais competing with this Russian folk tune and his battle theme. And it, it's absolutely, it's exhilarating, absolutely wonderful music. And um, the, the 1966 Carrion recording absolutely makes me laugh when he substituted the strings at the opening for an actual Russian chorus. <laughs> and then at the end, he brings in bells, cannons, the lot. It's, he just goes absolutely over the top with it. And it's glorious. Um, but I think for me, this is a piece that it, it's like Russia's version of the pomp and circumstance overtures, but times 20 gazillion. <laughs> and I think it's the piece that we, we should actually hear a little bit more and, and take more seriously, I suppose. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you've mentioned Tchaikovsky because uh, I, I mean, people, people, of course, have mentioned Tchaikovsky. They, you're right. They didn't really. People are almost afraid yeah. to mention 1812 to, to come across all, all popular. I mean, I, I have yeah. to admit, I'm, I'm not a fan of the piece at all. But uh, and the other one I was really hoping no one would mention was Capriccio Italien. I don't know whether that's a uh, class as an overture or not, but absolutely my, my no. least favourite Tchaikovsky ever written. <laughs> but, um, but the one that has to be mentioned is Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, that was almost on my list. Fantasy Overture, because one of the all-time great programmatic works, I think, and also just the return of that great tune at the end. St however many times I've played it and heard it, it still puts the hairs uh, up at the back of my neck. It is, I think, one of those one of the great Tchaikovsky moments, and goodness, there are plenty of those to put hairs on the back of your neck. But yeah, I think I think uh, Romeo and Juliet's great. I mean, again, it's a, it's you can follow the story through, even though it's just an overture. Really, it's a fantasy overture, of course. What you called it, but yeah, brilliant. Well, I think part part of that one's um, strength is the fact that it isn't actually a programmatic blow by blow, blow telling of Romeo no. and Juliet. He's taken no. the themes and then he makes something. He makes poetry out of it. Basically, yeah. it's a poem about Romeo and Juliet rather than telling yeah. the story, and he it's does sort it absolutely of, masterfully. It's your little pocket version of it isn't it in one yeah it's lovely yeah 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 um yeah. okay sorry and the other one, one that i would yeah my other one would be the mendelssohn hebrides overture oh, yes. which is just uh, it was i still remember when i got up to the top orchestra in my county youth service and that one arrived <laughs> on my music stand in the first violins and that was one of those moments i thought i'd made it at that point um, <laughs> beautiful beautiful programmatic piece in which he combines his kind of his classical bones with his romantic bones to absolutely beautiful effect richard what have we absolutely not well, mentioned that we must god i can't i can't believe that i would talk about the most perfect overture of all time the marriage of figaro the miss Apps. I mean, how brilliantly that was done. The fact that Mozart apparently um, included a slow central section in the first sketch, which he instantly scratched out, how totally right. It just shows you how spot on his instinct was. Um, <laughs> again, not easy to play either, is it? That's the thing. It's often, <clears throat> certainly the bass parts. Um, um, yeah, atmosphere, excitement at the very beginning, you know, the whole world of the opera bursting on you and all its life and abundance, yet giving nothing away about what's going to happen. None of that music reappears. Um, then, I mean, You've got to, we talked about Mendelssohn, Midsummer Night's Dream. Charlotte just mentioned the Hebrides. I think he pretty much invented the idea of the concert overture. Um, you know, the great romantic German tradition of Weber, Oberon, the Freischutz with his moody horns in the forest and some snarling trombones and incredible atmosphere. Um, Yuri Anthe, without which we wouldn't have Richard Strauss's Don, Don Juan. Um, Oberon, most, again, Mendelssohn fairy music taken to an even more perfect pitch. Um, then, I don't know, just my pers personal favourites I wanted to throw in. The um, Il Segreto di Susanna by Wolf Ferrari, a little three-minute overture mm. to a perfect little comic opera, which absolutely zings, absolutely zings. One brilliant little Italian tune after another, absolutely sparkles. Um, 
um, I thought I ought, to, I ought to mention at least one operetta overture. So many good ones to choose from. Deflated Mouse is the one that gets played most in the concert hall for obvious reasons. Um, the Supe overtures still have, hang on where his operettas haven't. Um, you know, everyone knows the melody from Light Cavalry, even they don't. They don't know the whole overture. The whole overture has a fantastic Hungarian gypsy interlude, which again people tend to forget, along with the galloping sort of military music. Um, but I also mentioned another way: the, the operetta composer Richard Heuberger, who wrote an operetta called An, an Opera Ball um, in about 1898, which is a, a delightful overture. Um, it really fizzes along. It's, it's it's warm. It's witty. It's full of Viennese melody. Um, and apparently, it was actually orchestrated by Zemlinsky. Apparently, Heuberger wasn't quite great at um, getting things done on time. That like great showbiz tradition of finishing at the last minute. He follows out to his pal Zemlinsky. <clears> and it has a kind <throat> of warm, late romantic glow. Yes, at the same time, it fizzes along like Johann Strauss as his best. And that's a cracking piece. And Vaughan Williams, The Wasps. How can we, oh, yes. in this country, not mention that? Yeah. What, a, what a cracking piece. And, <laughs> yeah. and how, how, how unusual to hear Vaughan Williams, you know, absolutely zinging along at quite a lick, you know, yes. throwing out great tunes left, right and centre. Yeah. Colourful, Straussian orchestral effects. You yeah. know, doing the orchestration, doing the melodies, doing the thump thumping tunes, all the stuff that we don't think of Paul Williams as doing generally. And he's doing it all perfectly, brings it in bang on time. With that. I, I love doing those trills. I love playing those trills at the beginning, the wasps sort of singing and swarming. And um, mm -hmm. those tunes, those tunes at the middle, that glorious moment when it just all opens out and we've got this sort of dreamy pastoral film, Williams Rhapsody. Is, like you're looking out, suddenly a window is open, you're gazing out over this glorious landscape. And then back to the fun, back to the, the craziness, back to the, the wasps, back to the comedy. Oh, I'm so pleased you've met, you mentioned that. You mentioned uh, Weber, Oberon. Is that the one that starts with the solo horn line? Yes. Because yes, yes, uh, yes. when I was at Radio 3, I, we did a series of programmes where I was thrown in the deep end, um, th that kind of style of programme. And I went and uh, conducted the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra as part of it. And my my guide was uh, Martin Brabins. And, and it's because they were doing a live uh, lunchtime uh, broadcast and the first piece was, was Weber's Oberon. And so I, was, I conducted it. Um, so we did the rehearsals and everything. It was all very exciting. And it, I'd never conducted a professional orchestra before. So there I was. And then, of course, the horn player did what horn players have often done with this piece. He played it at the wrong pitch so that when the orchestra, rest of the orchestra comes in, it sounds absolutely appalling. However, he didn't bet on my perfect pitch. So I spotted it and told him to play it in the right key. And genuinely, I don't think I've ever felt more satisfaction in my entire life than spoiling the a horn player's joke uh, in a rehearsal. But it, that's Ooh. what I, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, there's, but there's, a, there's stories of Alan Civil, I think, um, uh, where one conductor he didn't particularly like, and the, they, they agreed that he would just, the, Alan Civil, the horn player, would just start the piece on his own. He didn't need... Uh, you know, to be have it beaten out uh, by the by the conductor, and so the conductor came on, and and gestured, and Alan Civil was still sitting there looking at his newspaper. That was the first thing, and then the second. So he was complained about, and then the second time they did it, the conductor came on, and by the time the applause had finished, Alan Civil had already started. So <laughs> the, these are the jokes that one used to play. I think I don't think they really get away with it in modern orchestras <laughs> these days. But anyway, a couple I wanted to throw in. Uh, one which I, I, I mentioned slightly, uh, which is one that Michael Seals said that I would definitely choose, and he's right, is Shostakovich's Festive Overture. Played that yeah. many, many, many times. Only ever played the snare drum part. Love the snare drum part in that. It's almost like a solo instrument. Feels like, well, that's what, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. But it's uh, one of those great Tchaikovsky, uh, uh, Shostakovich moments, you know, big theme, very bombastic, big, um, uh, very, very fast, percussive um, strings, everything you'd ever want really in, in a Shostakovich piece in a nice handy sort of five minutes or so. Uh, and uh, again, great big fanfare at the beginning is another great way to, uh, to start or finish a, a, a concert. Um, and the other one I just want to throw into uh, talking of snare drums is Rossini's Thieving Magpie, which is ah. what I've done when I, it was one, of, I think it was the first Rossini I ever played. I think it was probably about 10 or 11 in an orchestra um, summer course. And we did Thieving Magpie. It starts with two snare drums. We had them antiphonal um, uh, with a big roll, a loud roll, and then a quiet roll. And uh, I'll never forget that as my entry into uh, Rossini and Rossini overtures again. I mean, these, the stories of Rossini and overtures are legend, aren't they? With him sort of essentially writing it a half an hour before the premiere of the opera and throwing 
bits of, of manuscript out the window to the copyist who then does the parts. I mean, I, I love stories like that, the way in which he, well, he threw those things. Yeah, he, he, was, he was writing an opera every three months around yes. that time. <laughs> you know, it was just incredible. Yeah. But that, I've got a good story about the thing with Magpie, you know, the, uh, with your drum rolls, you know, that uh, Abado, right at the beginning of his time with the LSO, uh, was doing a concert and they came to him just before he went on stage and said, Maestro, we've forgotten. You have to conduct the national anthem. And he said, but I don't know the national anthem. How's it go? He said, no, it's very simple. It's just slow. Um, and it's in four. It's four, four. You just conduct and you'll be fine. We know how to play it. It'll be fine. <laughs> so he went out onto the thing. So he's picked up it, you know, in a beautiful, elegant way, started conducting in four. And the first thing that happened, there was this enormous drum roll. <laughs> And everybody got up to their feet. That completely threw him. <laughs> then, he con then he started conducting in four. And lo and behold, the orchestra started playing. And it took a while for it to, for it to dawn on him that they, they were actually playing in three. <laughs> 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 and they were just wreathed in, in, in grins. They were smiling. To them. They, they loved the fact that they, they, they used to take the mic out of him nonstop. But, yes. and, and he kind of loved it and hated it as well. But then uh, finally... Having got through that embarrassment, he then got onto the first piece in the, in the program, which was the Thieving Magpie. <laughs> so he started with a lot of confidence and gave this huge drum roll, and the audience stood up again. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And quite right, too, by the way, for a senior. Yeah, they, they were completely confused, yeah. <laughs> so nothing, nothing awkward there, then. All right, Paul, we've reached your final choice. Oh, well, that, 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 that was on my list, actually, The Thieving Magpie, because there's nothing quite like that piece for me, uh, you know, that you actually, you're, you have the audience behind you and you really feel that you're, you, you know, you're, 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 the excitement is growing between all the musicians in the pit and the orchestra and the audience in the hall. It's a wonderful, it's like a kind of great helter-skelter thing that, yeah. that delivers everybody at the right place at the right, by the time you finished it. And... We've talked about Tannhäuser a few times. It's gone, it, we've gone through, we've mentioned it, haven't we, in passing, but it was mm. definitely on my list, definitely on my list. The idea that this man, as, as Richard said earlier, you know, this, had, he, he tried, his, tried his luck with Rienzi and was so determined to become, you know, taken seriously as a composer and then finally getting to Dresden and uh, them accepting Rienzi as, as one of his uh, pieces that they would put on and uh, Flying Dutchman, I think, which hadn't, he'd had no success in Paris. Finally, he gets to put on Tannhäuser and uh, it, it, that overture. I don't, why did he stop calling them overtures, I wonder? Why did they become four spieler or preludes? No idea. Anyway, this, as you say, this was a real overture. And that, as rather like the the, the Tchaikovsky Romeo it's long you know and even when with the Venusberg music it gets even longer but every note of it you know the the bet this fantastic contrast between the pilgrims and the sense of the, the pilgrims and and society and the, the 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 rules as it were on one side and, the, and that dying away and then the sort of mist swirls and you you're delivered into this world of complete pornography with venus on the on the top of the mountain and the and this this great passionate love scene it's it's, it's, it's the most wonderful daring music and thrilling to play and, and completely captivating i think for the audience love it fantastic oh, by the way uh richard one of the composers we haven't mentioned but actually has been mentioned quite a lot on social media is malcolm arnold who wrote a number of uh of fantastic overtures and uh, and I, and it's outrageous that I haven't mentioned him because I mention him almost every week. Yeah. Uh, but you know things like Becker's the Dandy Pratt and uh, Tamashanta and of course the Grand Grand Overture, which is the the, the overture to end all overtures, um, which is sort of taking the Mickey out of the entire process, uh, the entire genre of, of overtures. But he was a master at that too. I was, I don't know, I, I was holding Tam O'Shanter in reserve. I, I, I rather expected <laughs> you were going to choose something by Malcolm Arnold. Um, I, I was, I mean, it's one I quite like, it's one called the Commonwealth Christmas Overture, which is an occasional piece. I think he wrote it for television. Um, and it has a colossal middle section for steel band. Um, but either side of that, you've got this most terrific Malcolm Arnold as film composer kind of tune going on this you know swaggering fanfares and when it strides off with this gloriously stirring jaunty memorable um, main theme um, you know as we said before he's a composer who had so many ideas 
he, yeah. he could just almost throw them away on an occasion. Yeah, wonderful. But, and yeah. and Nielsen was the other one, by the way, that's mentioned because Nielsen wrote mm. an enormous number of really bizarrely titled occasional works for uh, that he was commissioned to to write for all sorts of funny organisations and places and things. I, I, um, I was I was keen to mention his overture to Masquerade, his comic opera. Mm. Um, which which is another delightful, fizzing, whirling, uh, entertaining little zinger of a piece that always works really well in concert as well. It's a real, real proper comedy overture in the Figaro style. Well, we're in mm. we're in danger of reaching Paul's five hundred number here uh, with all our mentions. Yeah, we are, aren't we? <laughs> but it, it's been been fabulous. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Charlotte, and thank you very much, uh, Paul, for joining us this week. It's been fabulous, and uh, I'm sorry it was so so difficult, so uh, wrenching for you to find a. Uh, five or six or seven or however many it was you ended up choosing oh god well i've still, I've still got 10 more <laughs> very good oh well uh, well we shall we shall continue the conversation uh, with everybody on uh, on facebook and uh, on twitter as well we we, we as I, I say every week we love hearing all of uh, your ideas as well and uh, goodness we've had so many of them do have a look at the hashtag uh, classical top five on Twitter, if you can, you'll see many of uh, people's ideas there and uh, join in if you can. And if you do listen to us on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, please do, if you're enjoying the show, do give us a nice rating or a comment. It really does actually help. It helps us gain visibility and therefore popularity. And uh, that would be very, very nice indeed. Thank you very much for that. And uh, OK, so thank you, as always, to Richard and Charlotte and particularly to our special guest, Paul Daniel. Uh, we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Bye bye.